Hey, we're going to have a wonderful, wonderful time. I'm very excited. Now, I know that most of our people don't bring a physical Bible anymore. They have their phone or whatever. How many of you have a physical Bible today? Oh, about five of you. If you have it, go ahead and open it. And if not, grab your phone. I want you to see this. What I'm about to share with you is one of the most amazing prophetic passages in the entire Bible. You will absolutely love it. Lord, help me to minister life. Give your people here and on Facebook eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to understand in Jesus' name. How many of you woke up an hour early and felt just the same? Anyone dragging today? Okay, a little bit. Listen, if you are watching online, just let us know who you are. Give us a shout out. That's great. We've been talking about what I call a closer look at the Psalms. And I want us to look today at a very powerful Psalm. If I were to ask you what is the most famous Psalm of all, you would probably say Psalm 23. Very good. Let's go one chapter to the left. Let's go to Psalm chapter number 22. As Christians, we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is the second person of the Trinity. God the Father sent him to die for our sins. And if you've been saved for a while, you say this kind of thing. I know Jesus died for our sins. Like it was no big deal. Everyone does it. No issue. But I want to show you something very interesting because we are going to be looking at a psalm that was written by David. And it is absolutely a remarkable prophetic picture of Jesus and the crucifixion. Jesus is at the center and the heart of the Bible. The Bible contains history. It con contains historical content. But the central theme is God's plan to redeem mankind from the fall of Adam and Jesus coming to be that Redeemer. I believe that Jesus is seen in every book of the Bible, including the book of Psalms. In fact, you may remember that after Jesus was raised from the dead, in the Gospel of Luke, keep your place in Psalm 22, but in Luke 24, it says this, verse 44 and 45, Jesus is speaking to his twelve. And he says, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in, and notice this phrase, the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Now Jesus is speaking. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. So notice something, Jesus broke down the Old Testament into three main sections. The law of Moses, we call that the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis through Deuteronomy. And then we have the prophets listed, and then we have the Psalms. And so we're going to be looking at one of the Psalms, and this verse says, all things must be fulfilled which were written in the Psalms concerning me. So we know that this particular Psalm, Psalm 22, is one of three what we call shepherd Psalms. Chapter 22, 23, and 24 go together. They are the shepherd ministries of Jesus Christ. Psalm 22 is in the past. It reveals Jesus suffering on the cross. And he is seen here as the good shepherd who dies for the sheep. Psalm 23 is in the present. Verse 1, the Lord is present tense my shepherd. And Jesus is seen here not as the good shepherd but as the great shepherd who cares for the sheep. And then in chapter 24, that is in the future, it speaks of Christ's future reign, and he is seen as the chief shepherd who comes for the sheep and takes them to glory. So Psalm 22 looks in the past at the sufferings of Jesus Christ. We have the blessing of Psalm 23 because of what Jesus suffered 
as outlined in Psalm 22. Charles Spurgeon, a tremendous preacher of a previous generation, said this. This psalm is called the Psalm of the Cross. And you're going to see that's an accurate statement. Now think about this. This psalm was written by David some 1,000 years before the crucifixion. Not 10 years or 100 years, 1,000 years earlier. And the Bible teaches that David was a king, but he was also a prophet. And he was given a glimpse of the coming Messiah. In fact, it gives us a picture of both Jesus' crucifixion and his resurrection. Now, there are many what we call messianic psalms. That, are, that would be psalms that have pictures of the Messiah in them, prophetic psalms. A messianic psalm, again, is a psalm that contains many references to Jesus Christ. One person said this, the psalms often have a double meaning. They describe the psalmist's own experience while also putting forth a messianic message of which the writer may be unaware in other words, David may have been writing some things about his own life. He may not have fully understood it, but he was led by the Holy Spirit to predict many of the things that would be coming because of Jesus as he came to Calvary. Psalm 22 is undeniably a graphic picture of Jesus on the cross. Many believe this psalm is purely messianic, meaning that it has no historical basis in the life of the psalmist David. In fact, the ancient church believed that Christ, not David, was the speaker in this psalm. This entire psalm is messianic. This will prove the inspiration of the scriptures to anyone with an open mind, and a teachable spirit. No human being could predict what would happen a thousand years later with such exactness. It wasn't just one thought or two thoughts. There's something like 17 passages that refer to Calvary in this psalm. And many of David's statements are not applicable to himself or any known event in history, only the cross. Now, as we examine this psalm, we're going to be looking at prophetic glimpses of Jesus, and there are five verses in this chapter that are specifically clearly quoted in the Gospels. You, know, you may remember many times it says that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by David, saying. There are five of those in Psalm 22. Let's look at verse number one. We know this well. It begins by saying this, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from delivering me and from my roaring words of distress? We know that Jesus quoted this verse while on the cross. We see his cry to the Father. He said, my God, my God, listen to me. This is the only time in Scripture where Jesus calls his Father by the name of God. The only time. Why is that? Because God, in his holiness, could not look upon sin. Now, it was not Jesus' sin. It was our sin he died for. Remember that Jesus died at 9 o'clock, or was crucified at night, excuse me. He died at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, six hours. But at noontime, everything became dark. There was a supernatural darkness in Jerusalem because for those three hours, Jesus was paying the price for our sin. He became sin that we might be made righteous. And so at that time, he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now think about this. Here's what David said in Psalm 37. I have not seen the righteous forsaken. I'm not saying that Jesus was unrighteous, but he took our unrighteousness. 
That's why he felt forsaken, because God cannot look and bless sin, so he had to turn his back for that season so that Jesus could become sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. There's no doubt this was the hardest part of Jesus' suffering, having been with the Father from all eternity without the slightest separation. It was hard to be forsaken even for a moment. It is the only time Jesus asked the Father a question but received no answer. Again, I believe that Jesus took upon himself the sin of the world at this time. God the Father did not really abandon Jesus. He turned his back on sin. The Father turned away from the Son As Jesus bore the full weight of our sins. He became sin with our sinfulness that we we could become righteous with his righteousness. Now, look if you would at verse number 6. Very interesting verse. But I am a worm, a reproach of men, and despised by God the people. I I have a funny story about worms, and many years ago, my mom had a dear friend named Betty Ringer, and uh, at that time, she had a heart for missions, and Jimmy Swaggart was raising some money from world missions or orphans or something, and they didn't have any money at the time to spare, and so they said, let's just grab some, let's go outside with the flashlight, and let's find some worms, and we'll sell the worms to the tackle shops, and then we'll give that money to world missions. Well, if you knew anything about Betty, she was probably in her 50s or 60s at the time, very prim, southern belle, very proper. She lived up north, but she was from the south, and she just, you could not imagine her doing this. So she's outside with my mom after the rain with the flashlight, and they would see a worm and grab it, and she'd say, out in the name of Jesus, out in the name of Jesus, out in the name of Jesus. And she took those worms and sold them and gave them money to world missions. $14. There we go. I'll just give the $14. What about you? No, that's awesome. But listen to this. But this word worm is interesting because it means it's the Hebrew word tola. Say that with me. Tola. And it means worm, but it means scarlet or crimson. What do you think that symbolizes? Usually in the Bible, the Hebrew word for a worm is rima, R-I-M-M-A-H, which means a maggot. But the Hebrew word used here for worm is tola. It means a crimson worm or a scarlet worm. Both scarlet and crimsons are the color of blood. They are deep red. Listen to this. The crimson worm looks more like a grub than a worm. When it is time for the female or mother crimson worm to have babies, and she does this only one time in her life, she finds the trunk of a tree, a wooden fence post, or a stick. She then attaches her body to that wood and makes a hard crimson shell. She is so strongly and permanently stuck to the wood that the shell can never be removed without tearing her body completely apart and killing her. The crimson worm lays her eggs under her body and the and then and the protective shell. When the baby worm they stay under the shell. Not only does the mother's body give protection for her babies, but it also provides them with food. The babies feed on the living body of the mother. After just a few days, when the young worms grow to the point that they are able to take care of themselves, the mother dies. As the mother crimson worm dies, she oozes a crimson or scarlet red dye, which not only stains the wood she is attached to, but also her children. They are, the color, they are colored scarlet red for the rest of their lives. 
After three days, the dead mother's crimson worm, the dead mother crimson worm's body loses its crimson color and turns into a white wax which falls to the ground like snow. So what did Jesus mean by saying, I am a worm? Just like the crimson worm, Jesus gave up his life on a tree so that his children might be washed with his crimson blood and their sins cleaned white as snow. He died for us that we may live through him. What did Isaiah 118 say? Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Jesus was a worm, Tola. He gave his crimson blood that you and I could be forgiven, delivered, healed, and set free. Now that's something to get excited about right there. What an amazing prophetic picture. Now it's interesting because there's a comparison given to various animals in this chapter that are related to beasts. For example, verse 12 talks about strong bulls. Verses 13 and 21 talk about, listen to this, a raging and roaring lion. Where do we hear that phrase? The devil goes about as a roaring lion. There are dogs that are mentioned and wild oxen. That shows me that when men reject God's truth, they become like animals. One person said the 22nd Psalm alone contains 17 predictions regarding the death of the Messiah. 17. Now think about this. David wrote this description of the Messiah's crucifixion 1,000 years before Jesus was born. And listen, 600 years before the Persians invented this horrible method of execution. How did Jesus die? He was crucified. When David prophesied in this psalm, crucifixion wasn't even invented yet. So David was writing about something that wasn't even invented. By the time that Jesus was condemned to die on the cross, the Romans had perfected what is described as the most painful method of death that a man could experience. There was nothing more vicious and gruesome if you saw The Passion of the Christ by Mel Gibson, scholars say that was a very accurate report of what took place in a crucifixion. In fact, the word crucifixion originates from the word excruciating, which means agonizing or very embarrassing. The agony of being crucified is described as so intense and traumatic that many a man would expire on the cross from the pain alone. Now we're going to put something up on the screen that will show you some interesting verses with their fulfillment. Verse 1, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus said this in Matthew 27, 47, or 46, one of his seven statements on the cross. That was an exact fulfillment, end quote. Verse 6, but I am a worm and not a man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. In Matthew 27, 29 through 31, Jesus was mocked and humiliated by the soldiers at the crucifixion. An exact fulfillment. Verse 7, all who see me laugh me to scorn. They sneer with the lip. They shake the head. Matthew 27, 39, the people who passed by the crucifixion shook their heads in mockery. Verse 14, is this the one who relied on the Lord? 
let, then let the Lord save him. Listen to me. Some, Matthew 27, 43, some said he trusted God. Let God rescue him. They said that exactly. Verse 14, I poured, I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. John 19, 31, out of Jesus' side flowed blood and water. Verse 15, my strength is dried up like sun-baked clay. My tongue clings or sticks to the roof of my mouth. John 19, 28, Jesus was very weak. One of his seven statements recorded on the cross was, I am thirsty. Number seven, or verse 16, but the seventh verse I want to share. Listen to this. They have pierced my hands and feet. That was a clear description of the crucifixion of Christ. They literally pierced his hands and his feet. And then verse 18, they part my garments among them and cast lots for my clothes. John 19, 23, and 24, this passage was quoted in the Gospels exactly and fulfilled by the Roman soldiers. And David prophesied this 1,000 years before it happened. What an amazing psalm. But here's the interesting thing. The first 21 verses of this psalm are a portrait of the crucifixion of Christ. But there's another section in this psalm. Verses 1 through 21 give us a picture of the crucifixion. But listen to me. Verses 22 through 31, which is the rest of the chapter is a picture of the resurrection. Not only is the crucifixion predicted, the resurrection is predicted as well. In another psalm, David said this, you will not leave my soul in hell, neither will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. The word Holy One, that phrase is capitalized. It is quoted in the book of Acts of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So not only was his death predicted, but his resurrection was predicted as well. There's a remarkable change in verse number 21. Jesus went from being forsaken to being heard and answered. The story goes from tragedy to triumph. Just off the top of your head, what did he say in verse number one? Why have you forsaken me? Verse two said this, oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not answer. Notice what he said, I cry, but you don't answer. But then verse 21 says this, Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild ox. You have answered me. Can you see the difference? In the crucifixion, God, you didn't hear. You didn't answer. You've forsaken me. At the resurrection, you have answered me. You see, the first 21 verses talk about the crucifixion. The remaining 10 talk about the resurrection. The early portion emphasizes prayer. The second half emphasizes praise. The first half talks about suffering, and the last half talks about glory. Now, who did Jesus die for? Everyone. God so loved the world. But in its simplest format or definition, we divide the world into three groups of people. Just three. And we can see all three of these right here. First of all is the assembly in verse 22. That refers to the church. The word assembly is translated as church in the book of Hebrews. 
Let me just read that to you. Verse number 22 says this. I will declare your name to my community or assembly. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. So Hebrews 2 shows us that even Jesus worshiped the Father in the midst of the assembly or church. So Jesus died for his people. That's believing Jews and believing Gentiles, the assembly of God's people. But the second thing is, the scripture talks about the offspring of Israel in verses 23 through 25. That refers, of course, to the Jews. Now, you understand God has a covenant with believers, but God also has a covenant with his chosen people, the Jews. They need to be born again. They need to receive Christ like everybody else. But God still has a covenant with them. And God is not through with his chosen people, the Jews. Many will believe and be saved. In fact, Zechariah said this. Jesus speaking in the first person. They will look on me whom they have pierced. And the remnant will be saved. Thank God he still has a plan for the Jewish people. And then lastly, the ends of the world. And that refers to the Gentiles. Now, obviously, David knew this psalm. He knew the Old Testament thoroughly. But it's interesting because someone said this. Jesus, the divine sufferer, may have and seems to have recited Psalm 22 to himself when he was on the cross. Now, we don't know that. We have seven recorded statements of Jesus. But I, I assume he said some other things while he was on the cross. Seven statements were recorded. But this is simply conjecture, but it sounds interesting. This chapter begins with, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? One of the seven statements on the cross. And it ends with this. According to some in the Hebrew, it ends with, It is finished. Let me read verse 31, the last verse of the chapter from the Amplified Version. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness to a people yet to be born, that he has done it, that it is finished finished. The Passion Translation, his generation yet to be born will glorify him and they will all declare it is finished. So this amazing psalm begins with one of the seven statements on the cross and it ends with another one of the seven statements on the cross. Verse 1 records Jesus' first statement on the cross Verse 31 records his last statement. This is beyond all others, the psalm of the cross. The Amplified Version says this, it may have actually been repeated by our Lord when hanging on the tree. It would be too bold to say so, but even a casual reader may see that it might have been. It begins with, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And it ends with the thought, it is finished. So David looks down through the centuries, for us some ten centuries later, and sees the people yet unborn who would enjoy Jesus' salvation and redemption. You know, there's a real attack right now on the authority of Scripture. And I don't know if it's the Word of God. It may contain the Word of God. It doesn't just contain the Word of God. It is the Word of God. It is our absolute final authority. And as you begin to study these prophetic passages, passages you see it like never before. I saw someone that was talking about the Syrophoenician woman on a little TikTok 
quote, and it talked about how Jesus called this woman a, a dog, and they didn't understand that that was actually, uh, the, in the Greek, a little dog. It wasn't an insult. He was trying to say, hey, I'm not sent to you, the Gentiles, which are dogs. I'm sent to the Jewish people. There was a reason he did that. It wasn't slang. It wasn't disrespectful. But they said, you know, Jesus was only human, and she called out power. Jesus was human, but he wasn't only human. He was and is the Son of God. And he knew just what he was doing. He didn't miss it. He brought her up to the level of receiving children's bread. Listen to me. This passage, Psalm 22, shows the power, the majesty, and the authority of the prophetic Scripture. Amazing revelation. Down through the centuries, David saw the people yet unborn and recognized they would enjoy Jesus, salvation, and redemption. As I mentioned earlier, we have the blessing of Psalm 23, where it says, The Lord is my shepherd. I will not want. My cup runs over. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life. That is a reality because of the previous chapter and what Jesus did on Calvary's tree. My friend, here's the good news. Unlike David, who saw through a glass darkly, who may not have even fully recognized what he was seeing. We don't look ahead through a glass darkly. We look back at what took place 2,000 years ago. He became sin that we might be made righteous. He became poor that we might be blessed. He became sickness that we might be healed. He took our shame that we might be forgiven. Everything you have need of is found in the cross of Jesus Christ. Someone said this. People say, well, we don't want to stop at the cross. We want to go to the resurrection. Absolutely. But listen to me. Make the cross your permanent address. Don't stop there. But always go back to it to remember what Jesus did for you and me and for the rest of the world. What an amazing prophetic picture of what Jesus did for all of us. We don't have to pay the price. All we need to do is say, Lord, I receive what Jesus did. So many people say, well, I'm going to heaven. I've been a pretty good person. I was, I've been kind. I, I helped my neighbor if good works would get us to heaven, my first question is, how many good works are enough? We don't know the answer. If that was the answer, and that's not even the answer, but here's the reality. If good works were enough, why did Jesus have to come? I've never forgotten the time I saw a video as a young man uh, that T.L. Osborne showed of, of, of men, I believe it was in Africa, in, a, in another country, and they were walking down the street and they ha actually had, uh, it was a whip, and on the end of it was either glass or metal or shards of some sort, and they would take it and throw it over one shoulder, and it would dig into their skin, and they would rip it. Then they would take it over their other shoulder, pay the price, and rip it again. And they were doing that to pay the price for their sins. How many of you know we all recognize we're sinners without Jesus. We need the touch of God. We need the grace of God. Here's the good news. We don't have to do that. Jesus paid that price. All we have to do is say, Lord, I believe it, and Lord, I receive it. The power of the cross is still available for you today. Amen and amen. Whatever you have need of today, it is found in the cross. And I'll say it this way. If it's not found in the cross, listen to me, you don't need it. Whatever you have need of 
is found in the cross. If it is not found in the cross, you don't need it. Maybe you're here today and there is shame upon your shoulders. Maybe there is a broken relationship in your life. Maybe there is sickness in your body. Maybe you're dealing with oppression or depression or fear or heaviness because of COVID. Maybe you're mourning a relationship that has gone south. Maybe you're tired in your emotions and you just need restored. Anything you have need of is found in the cross of Jesus Christ. But the most important thing you'll ever do is get rid of your sins by receiving what Jesus Christ did. Going to heaven, coming to Christ is not being good enough. It's not working for it. Saying, Lord, I am a sinner. I need a Savior. And today I receive what Jesus did on the cross. If you'll do that, He will come into your life and make you a brand new creation. With everyone bowing their head for just a moment, is there anyone in here that would say, Pastor Mark, I've never been born again. I've never asked Christ to come into my life and I want to make sure that my sins are forgiven and that I'm on my way to heaven and that I'll miss hell and make heaven my home. If that's you, just quickly raise a hand and just wave at me so that I'll recognize that anyone that would like to receive Jesus Christ today. Today is your day, if you've never done that before. Today is your day. Secondly, if you're in here today and you would say, Pastor Mark, those things you talked about earlier, the the relationships, perhaps a job breakthrough, some kind of miracle, some kind of breakthrough, some kind of of deliverance in your body, your emotions, your, your mind, your finances, whatever it is. If that's you, just wave at me right now. I believe many of us, if not all of us, would be in that situation. Be honest. That's probably most of us. I don't think you're coming in here saying, I'm perfect, everything's great, don't have an issue. If that's you, here's what I'm gonna ask all of us to do. I'm going to have all of us stand right now. Honey, would you grab the microphone right now? How many of you could use something from the cross today? Talk to me now. Can you use something? Is there something you need from the cross of Christ? We're going to believe God. We sang that song, He's a Miracle Worker. Let's believe in this atmosphere for whatever miracle you have need of. Come on up here if you don't mind. It's a little easier. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Well, we're just, this morning when we gathered, there was such a beautiful flow for healing. And we know that by Jesus' stripes, we were healed. And that doesn't mean, you know, obviously our sins were forgiven. But before Jesus got to the cross, as, you know, Pastor Mark mentioned, you know, some people feel like they have a need to repeat what he did. But he took it. We don't have to repeat that. But he wore stripes. He was wounded for our transgressions, right? He was bruised for our iniquity, the chastisement of our peace. That means anything that tries to worry you or trouble you or oppress you, Jesus bore that so that you can walk in peace. And by his stripes, we were healed. Mm -hmm. You know, they beat Jesus before he got to the cross. He did take that, you know, that whip that had pieces of bone in it that ripped his flesh off his skin. He did that so that you would be healed. He was that sacrificial lamb. You know, in the Old Testament, it talks about how, you know, we use the word scapegoat. Oh, they're the scapegoat. In other words, everyone blames that person for something. But the word scapegoat is a Bible word because they literally took a goat and they would put their hands, the priest put the hands on the goat And it would pronounce all the sins of Israel, the entire nation, upon the goat. And they would drive the goat out into the wilderness. It was literally the scapegoat. It literally took all... uh, It was a picture of what Jesus would do. 
in the future. It would drive all the sins away. So today, whatever you have need of, we're going to receive from the Lord today. Hallelujah. Father, I just thank you right now yes. for a flow of your spirit in this place, a yes. river that flows, a river of provision. Lord, you said there's a clear crystal river that flows from your throne, that flows from the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God that was sacrificed, the Lamb of God that gave up his life for us, and that bore stripes so that we would be healed. And from him flows a river a river of healing, a river of provision, a river of strength, a river of peace. Hallelujah. 